Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar, Ketogenic Diets. Are they effective? Are they healthy? And what do you need to know about them? We are super excited to share with you today our perspective on this timely and somewhat controversial topic. We want you to reach your health goals and are happy to provide you with information that can help you reach them while avoiding dietary and lifestyle pitfalls. This webinar is the third in our summer webinar series, Transcending What's Trending. We found in our collective 60 plus years of personal experience, as well as our research, education, and clinical experience that it's so easy to be pulled in different directions depending on the prevailing trends in the health world, and that education is the greatest predictor of success on a raw food and plant-based diet. For those of you who don't know us yet, I'm Dr. Karen Dina, and you'll be hearing from Dr. Rick Dina in a few minutes. We're both chiropractic physicians with a strong interest in plant-based and raw food nutrition. We're board certified and licensed in the state of California. We've also hosted Raw Food Summits for the past four years, where we have interviewed successful, healthy, long-term raw vegans to share with you how you can be successful on this path over the long term as well. We're also the authors of the Raw Food Nutrition Handbook, the developers of the Science of Raw Food Nutrition series of classes that we taught in person for 10 years, and the developers and instructors of the Mastering Raw Food Nutrition online and interactive program, which we'll share more about later on this webinar. From this and speaking at many conferences and events over the years, we've become known for our thoroughness and scientific accuracy, our ability to make complex subjects easy to understand, and our encouraging approach that takes unnecessary hurdles out of people's way. Before we continue, we would like to let you know that the information and opinions expressed by us in this webinar are not intended to be used as medical advice and should not be used to diagnose or treat any medical condition or as a substitute for individual health care. This webinar is presented with the understanding that Drs. Rick and Karen Dina, us, are not liable for misconception, misuse, or adverse effects resulting from its use. Any type of dietary change, nutritional therapy, or fasting should always be undertaken with the supervision of a qualified healthcare practitioner. We may end up being those healthcare providers for you, but watching this webinar does not establish a doctor-patient relationship. So now we'd like to share with you a little bit about what inspired each of us to start on this path in the first place. First, you'll hear from me, and then you'll hear from Dr. Rick. I found raw food at a time when I was experiencing notable fatigue, for which there was allegedly no answer. I was in the college at the time, and I was sleeping 10, 12, and sometimes more hours per night, and I'd wake up feeling like I still needed more sleep. I saw three medical professionals, and after multiple lab tests and evaluations, I finally had a diagnosis fatigue of unknown origin. They had a whole list of everything that I didn't have, but could not pinpoint the source of my fatigue. I asked every single one of them if my fatigue may have had anything to do with my college diet and lifestyle, and they all emphatically said no. I started reading and researching different healing systems, which eventually led me to a whole food plant-based dietary approach, and when I implemented that, my fatigue improved. But when I learned about and implemented a raw food plant-based diet, my energy soared beyond the impressive improvements that I had experienced by eating just a whole food plant-based cooked diet. Long story short, my fatigue vanished along with a variety of other symptoms that I'd had for years, and I had more energy than I knew what to do with. I started to look healthier. I slept better. I enjoyed exercising and my digestion improved. I was so inspired by the health results that I was experiencing that I felt compelled to learn more about the inner workings of the human body, nutrition, and the diet health connection. 
I really wanted to immerse myself in learning as much as I could. So I read lots of raw food books. I attended conferences and lectures and gatherings, and I talked to lots of different people about their experience. I even listened to a local raw food radio program. All of this was great, but I really wanted much more depth and detail. I wanted to find out why I was able to get so much better. I was totally on a mission. I went back to school to earn a second undergraduate degree in biology, and I received doctorate level education in naturopathic medicine and chiropractic, which helped me to put everything that I had observed into perspective and on a much deeper level. During this time, my fatigue recovery was totally put to the test. I received an academic scholarship for my biology degree, but I was totally on my own for all my other expenses, so I had to work half to full time along with studying for my academically rigorous classes. And I had to keep up my GPA to maintain my scholarship. On many days, I would go to school, and then I'd go to work, and then I'd study for a few hours, and then I'd go to bed. And then during my naturopathic and chiropractic education, I had a similar schedule. I attribute my ability to keep this schedule for as long as I did to my raw food diet. When I think back to my pre-raw days, there's really no way that I would have been able to keep this type of schedule. I was just so inspired and motivated by my results with raw food that I stayed on this formal educational path for over a decade, knowing that I would have the education and experience to make a difference in people's health with this solid educational foundation. Now, I've learned a lot through my research, education, clinical, personal, and teaching experience. So over the years, I've refined and revised my approach to raw food and tailored it to my individual needs. And with the educational opportunities that Dr. Rick and I have developed and teach, we can show you how to do this too. And speaking of Dr. Rick... Next, he'll share a bit about his background and experience with raw food and plant-based nutrition with you. Hi, everyone, and thanks for tuning into our webinar. Now that you've heard from Dr. Karen, I'm going to share with you just a few relevant pieces of my history and my background that led me to where I am today with whole food, plant-based, and raw food nutrition. So I ate conventionally growing up. And for the most part, I was a pretty healthy kid with the major exception of some hay fever allergy type issues that developed about mid elementary school. So what would happen is every spring and then secondarily in the fall, my nose would drip sometimes hours at a time, sometimes all day. My eyes would get red and itchy and watery. And worst of all, when this was going on, I would feel completely drained of energy, totally exhausted. Several days a year, I had to miss school and work, and I even missed an entire year of playing Little League Baseball. Moving on to my freshman year in college, I gained the classic freshman 15, but I already had a 15-pound head start from high school. And here we have a picture of me with that extra weight, and I was having a pretty bad allergy day at the time as well, and it really motivated me to want to start making some changes to my diet and lifestyle to see if I could feel better. So I started to make some significant changes after my freshman year in college or starting near the end of that. And over the summer before my sophomore year, I lost about 15 pounds of extra fat. I really felt so much better that I kept reading and kept learning and kept implementing. And about a year after that start, I switched my diet to vegan, all vegan, and mostly raw at about the same time. That brought my health up several levels, and I've maintained about a 90% raw diet ever since then. So here's a photo of me when I was a few months into being raw and vegan, and a picture is worth a thousand words. Again, I felt so much better than I did about a year before. So I wanted to keep learning as much as I could. 
I read books, magazines, went to conferences, listened to audio programs uh, uh, in the car while I was driving and just filled myself up with as much information as I could. My junior year in college, I fasted on water only for 14 days while living in my college dorm. That was in the winter. And in addition to so many other benefits, I noticed when that spring came along, I had almost no allergy symptoms. I was just absolutely blown away and so impressed. That fueled my motivation to keep learning uh, more and more. In fact, later on my junior year, when it was spring weekend and there were bands and parties and all sorts of fun things happening on campus, I drove several hours to um, to attend a raw food conference, and I've never regretted that decision ever since then. Uh, moving on to some uh, continued history, back in 1991, I worked at Hippocrates Health Institute. Later that year, I went to work for the Juice Man Company. I was part of the support team that flew around the country and, and set up events in hotels and uh, sold juicers and told people about the benefits of juices and fresh fruit and vegetable-based diets. It's a lot of fun. Sometimes a crowd would gather around while I was explaining things, and I just thought, hey, this is cool. So no wonder years later I'm speaking to you now on this webinar. Um, I still wanted to keep learning more in as much depth as I can, so I went back to school to earn a doctorate degree in chiropractic, where I was learning all of the foundational sciences and getting things in just exponentially more depth than I understood them before, and, and things are really, really coming together. That gave me the opportunity to... Um, go out to Northern California and be on staff as a fasting doctor, which I did for four years, and I gained such a wealth of clinical experience, not only from seeing the fasting patients, but having that doctorate background, as well as learning from more experienced doctors, um, that just brought things again to a whole new level. Just for fun, here's a picture of me um, when I was at True North, that was 12 years in now, to being a vegan. Now, I was so much in my element there, teaching people about nutrition and seeing what happens with fasting, but I actually left after four years because I was young and emotional and I was in love. So I moved to be with the woman I fell in love with. I actually moved up to Seattle, Washington. And while I was there, I put together a program that I taught at Bastyr University for naturopathic medical students. And as it turns out, that uh, woman who I fell in love with was Dr. Karen. And so we had a, uh, <laughs> there was a good outcome there. Um, we teamed up and later on, skipping a few years, we developed a curriculum called the Science of Raw Food Nutrition. And we taught that in person for 10 years. And then after that 10 years of teaching in person, we updated, improved, and expanded that into our online mastering raw food nutrition program. Also, since about 2011, I have been in clinical practice where I work with people um, regarding lab work and dialing in their diets who are interested in raw food and vegan paths. And that oftentimes gives me a much different perspective compared to just reading journal articles that we do a lot of and put together and make sense. So all of this comes together in our curriculum. And for those of you interested, we're going to talk more about the details of that at the end of this webinar. In the 30 years that Dr. Karen and I have each been on this path, we have seen so many trends come and so many trends go in the plant-based, raw food, and general health fields over this time. But what has always been consistent, no matter what or who was trending at the time, is that when people add more fresh fruits and vegetables and other whole natural plant foods to their diets, while well, simultaneously decreasing, or better yet, eliminating processed foods, all sorts of health benefits can be realized, as many of you have heard so many examples of in our raw food summits over the past four years and in other places, and maybe for many of you in your own experience as well. 
We sincerely want all of you to be able to understand the most important concepts and practices so you can achieve extraordinary health no matter who or what is trending at the time. We truly want all of you to be trend-proof. So many times when something seemingly new comes on the scene, we think to ourselves how incredibly important it is to have a strong, solid foundation in a scientifically valid perspective of nutrition so you can make sense out of what you see and what you hear. With this foundation, you are so much better equipped to be able to distinguish what is valuable from what is not. So an example from class. So after about six hours worth of some really intensive in-depth study and analysis of fatty acids and essential fats and, and omega-3 conversion, where we look at a bunch of case histories and go through all different foods and diets and really analyze everything really thoroughly, on one of our weekly conference calls, a student raised her hand and said, okay, Dr. Rick, I want to make sure I understood this. And she was explaining everything, and I was very proud of her. She, she was getting it all right. And then she put that together with a YouTube video that she had seen with somebody explaining why they've now left the movement. And fatty acid imbalance and not having enough DHA was one of the movements she cited. And our students said, oh my gosh, you know, here's what we're learning in class. Here's what this person said. And if only this person had that solid foundation, they never would have had to leave the movement in the first place because, because they could have gotten what they needed within the raw vegan realm and therefore continued to get all the benefits from it. So I was very proud of my student and it's a, a really good example. So you can't just go to Dr. Google or earn a PhD from YouTube and think that you've got it all covered. If this was true, then we would see more people staying in the movement these days than compared to before social media came on the scene. But in fact, it's just the opposite. So when you have the truly solid foundation, this allows you to stay on track and truly achieve a lifetime of supercharged health. And once again, that's what we want for every single one of you. Having said that, let's now move on to our topic for this webinar in our Transcending What's Trending series. The topic of today's webinar is ketogenic diets. Now, ketogenic diets are diets where the majority of the calories come from fat. We talked a little bit about in the last webinar, intermittent fasting, that when you are burning just fat for energy, that ketones are the byproducts of fat metabolism. So in other words, when you're in ketosis, you are burning fat, and that is the goal of ketogenic diets. Now, as soon as you get enough carbohydrates in your diet, somewhere around 10% or so, you come out of ketosis. And the reason for that is because your body preferentially uses the carbohydrates for energy and is not therefore burning as much fat for energy. Therefore, your level of ketones goes down and you are out of ketosis. So because of that, the carbohydrate intake must be minimized. Now, depending on which ketogenic practitioner or our teacher or authority you speak with, you want to keep your carbohydrates down to somewhere between 20 and 50 grams of carbohydrates. Again, somewhere around 10% or so of the calories from carbohydrates. Now, the protein intake is not as critical. And the reason for that is because the body preferentially uses fat for energy over protein. So if a bit of extra protein comes in, your body's going to keep burning fat for energy. Uh, it won't derail the fat burning the same way that carbohydrates do. However, when we have an excess of protein, our body wants to turn that into fat. Any excess calories from any source, carbohydrate, fat, or protein, gets stored as body fat. 
Now, in order for protein to get stored as body fat, it has to go through the process of gluconeogenesis. It actually gets converted into glucose first. So if you have too much excess protein and gluconeogenesis happens too much, then you're actually raising your level of carbohydrates, raising your level of glucose, and that can derail the system. But that it, it takes more to get there with excess protein compared with more carbohydrates. So anyway, mostly they talk about how carbohydrate intake has to be minimized. Now, the goals of ketogenic diets, like the goals of many types of diets and health plans, are to burn excess body fat and to keep it low, to lower the blood sugar and keep it stable, and in general, to improve health and well-being. Now, there are some areas where we're in agreement with the ketogenic approach. And uh, what we like about it is it greatly reduces, or better yet, eliminates refined and processed flour and sugar products. Now, in addition to these foods being high in the glycemic index and high in calorie density and low in nutrient density and low in dietary fiber, they're basically junk foods, these foods also come with some unhealthy fats, additives, preservatives, etc. as part of the package deal uh, to make things even worse. So we're all for getting those things out of your diet, therefore out of your body. Now, when we consume these processed sugar products, it's easy to put on extra body fat because, as we said, they're high in calorie density. But there are some other things beyond just calorie intake that can influence how much fat your body is going to either burn or store. And one of those things is that when we eat these processed sugar products that raises our glucose levels, then our body produces insulin as a result. And one of insulin's major jobs is to tell your body to make and store fat. So we don't want insulin to get too high. In addition to that, high glucose levels cause these type of reactions called glycation reactions. We go into a lot of detail about those in our curriculum, but the bottom line is glucose likes to stick proteins together. And when that happens, uh, to make a, a, a pretty complex story uh, much shorter, it accelerates the aging process. So we could do without that as well. Now, this extra fat that gets put on the body, especially when it's belly fat around the midsection, the fat itself is actually pro-inflammatory. It's almost like your extra fat becomes its own organ and it does a number of things that aren't so healthful. Um, in addition, when we have excess body fat, we raise the level of hormones such as our sex hormones that can actually contribute to the promotion of cancer. Not the initial cause of it, that comes from genetic damage, but it can promote the growth of cancer cells, so we don't want any of that happening. And pretty much anybody who's interested in improving health through a better diet agrees that these processed flour and sugar products uh, don't really have a place in anyone's healthy plan. There are some mistakes, though, that we see with the ketogenic approach. Now, number one is they lump all carbohydrates together. Okay, going back here, it says we just want to limit total carbohydrate intake. It does not distinguish uh, between which types. And as it turns out, there are many foods out there with significant carbohydrate content that are extremely healthy. So you've got to avoid these foods or severely limit these foods um, and, and to, to stay in ketosis, to be on a ketogenic diet. And we see that as a mistake and we'll explain why as we go along. Now, as it turns out, and I know this is a huge, big topic, uh, we, we've got an extensive amount of information in our curriculum about it. We go really into depth and and. You know, it's really awesome stuff, one of my favorite topics. Um, but we're, we're going to take a look at it, just a few slides. We're going to borrow a couple of slides from our curriculum to help show that not all carbohydrates are the same. So we're taking a look at a classic study here, intentionally going back to 1982, to look at a study done by the Pritikin Longevity Center. 
And uh, in our curriculum, we show lots of other studies that show similar things uh, all the way up to the current day. And it's going to keep working that way uh, over the long term as well. So this just happens to be one I'm picking to show that we've known about these things or some of us have known about uh, these things for quite some time. So in this study, they took 60 people with diabetes and they went through their 26-day residential diet and lifestyle program. And in this program, they get exercise and they eat a high-carbohydrate diet, but not just any type of high-carbohydrate diet, one that's also high in fiber and is unrefined from unrefined plant foods. So that tells you they're whole natural foods, vegetables, fruit, whole grains, beans, uh, those types of things. But 80% of the calories come from carbohydrates, 10% from protein, and 10% from fat. Some of you will recognize those macronutrient profile numbers. Now, if we were to go out and ask the average person, sir or ma'am, would you like to take a survey here? What do you think would happen to people with diabetes, their blood sugar is too high already, and most likely their weight is a bit too high already as well. What do you think would happen to these people if we put them on a diet where the great majority, in fact, 80% of the calories came from carbohydrates? Well, we know what most people would say. Oh my God, you shouldn't do that. I mean, that, that's like malpractice. You're going to make these people worse. Their, their blood sugar is going to go up. They're going to get fatter. That would be the prediction based on the prevailing trending thinking out there today, especially from the ketogenic community. But what actually happened? Well, as a whole, um, the average person lost nine pounds. Not bad. Uh, that, that's about you know 10 pounds a month on average, about two and a half pounds a week. Uh, nine pounds is about the same as four kilos. The fasting glucose went down from 195 down to 145 um, in millimoles per liter. If you're uh, familiar with that or used to that instead of milligrams per deciliter, like we use here in the United States, uh, 195 to 145 translates into 10.8 down to 8.0. So for those of you who are familiar with those numbers, they still have a ways to go, but that's a huge improvement in less than a month. Um, at the same time, their cholesterol went from 225 down to 182. So that's 5.8 down to 4.7 millimoles per liter. And their triglycerides, interestingly, blood fats went from 284 down to 186. That's equivalent to 3.2 down to 2.1. Now, by the way, many people say that carbohydrates raise your triglycerides. And there are some circumstances where that is the case. But that didn't happen here. They had a major, major reduction. Now, what makes these things even more impressive, these results more impressive, is that out of those 60 people, 23 were taking oral medication at the beginning, and 26 days later, the majority of them were off of their medication. Of those 60 people, 17 were taking insulin when they started, and 13 of the 17 were off of their insulin by the end of the program. So if you did nothing else except stopped taking your medication that lowered your blood sugar, what would happen when you stopped that medication? It would go up. But not only did it not go up, it went down. And similarly, if they had stayed on their medication and kept it consistent, then it's pretty safe to say these numbers would have been even more changed over those 26 days. So they lowered their medication, most of them got off of their medication, and their numbers went down dramatically from eating a high-carbohydrate diet. But they weren't just eating any carbohydrates, they were eating whole, natural healthy carbohydrates. Here is a recreation of some blood sugar curves reported in the British Medical Journal. So we have blood sugar level over here, and we've got time over here on this axis. And what this shows is it shows with a whole grain, yeah, they eat the whole grain, blood sugar level starts to rise, your body makes insulin, insulin starts to drive 
the glucose out of the blood and into the cells, and then the blood sugar level starts to drop. A little over an hour, it comes back to normal. With cracked grain, that would be something like bulgur wheat, like you make tabbouleh out of. Coarse grain is something like whole grain flour. And a refined grain would be like white flour. So you've ground it all up and dramatically increased the surface area so your body can access the carbohydrates more quickly. And in addition to that, you've taken the majority of the fiber away and the fiber helps to regulate your blood sugar. Now, for years and years, I've been talking about this and I've said, and it, it seems to still be true here in 2019, that some people cannot tell the difference between this whole grain curve and this refined grain curve. And I know they're hugely different, but people don't understand. They're different. Um, and what they, what they look at is here is something called the area under the curve, which... Uh, represents the overall glucose level over time. So the area under the whole grain curve is a fraction of the area under the refined grain curve. So not all carbohydrates are the same by any means. Now, fun little thing here is five, six, seven years ago, something like that, when Dr. Karen and I taught the precursor to our Mastering Raw Food Nutrition class called the Science of Raw Food Nutrition, uh, we taught that curriculum in person, and it was at a school that was you know, two, two and a half hours uh, away from our house. So one time when I was driving up there, I gave myself an assignment at the beginning of the trip to, to make good use of my driving time. And I said, I want to come up with some kind of catchy mnemonic that can distinguish healthy carbohydrates from unhealthy carbohydrates. And about 45 or so minutes into the trip, after I'm going through all this stuff in my head, no, no, and you know, finally figuring it out, I was so proud of myself, and here's what I came up with. CRAP versus carbs. <laughs> so CRAP, uh, and my mnemonic here, stands for carbohydrates that are refined and processed. And again, we all agree that we want to get those out of our diet because they're not so good. So what did I come up with for carbs? For that, I came up with carbohydrates that assist in the regulation of blood sugar. So the type of carbohydrates that the people who went on the Pritikin program consumed. And again, there's a world of difference between the refined and processed ones versus the ones that actually help regulate and keep our blood sugar stable. World of difference. Now, as significant as that is, that is by far not the biggest issue. A far larger issue is the degree to which your cells, and it's mostly your liver cells and your skeletal muscle cells, are either resistant to insulin or sensitive to insulin like they should be. And as it turns out, it's not carbohydrates that cause this phenomenon called insulin resistance, which interferes with insulin getting glucose out of the blood and into the cells. It's fat that interferes with that, pro with that process, but then carbohydrates not being able to get out of the blood and into the cells, that's the effect. So as far as fats roll, there is uh, body fat. The more body fat you have, all else being equal, the greater the degree of insulin resistance. And there's cool mechanisms with free fatty acids and the cytoplasm and how the insulin receptor uh, cyclic AMP and all this other stuff communicates with the glucose channel, but we won't get into that here. Um, the amount of dietary fat is significant. I know some people downplay that, but it definitely is significant. And what's also really significant is the profile of dietary fat intake. And, and in, in sort of some of the low fat camps, this is not recognized so well. So for example, all else being equal, and all else might not be equal, but all else being equal, the greater level of fat in your body the greater the degree of insulin resistance. At the same time, given a certain amount of calories from fat, the better the fatty acid profile, the greater insulin sensitivity there will be, 
And the unhealthier the fatty acid profile, the greater the insulin resistance would be. And I give some examples in our curriculum, and I think we I even talked about it in the last webinar in intermittent fasting, where a higher fat raw food diet actually showed much better blood sugar level measurements than a lower fat typical modern diet. So both the amount of dietary fat and the profile of fat both matter significantly. And uh, physical activity is a huge factor as well. And if you think about this logically, how can you have two people who eat the exact same meal and have one person have a really high blood sugar curve that's, uh, that's extended out over several hours, where the other person who eats that same meal has a much lower blood sugar curve that stays um, low um, or that gets back to normal after a shorter period of time. It's because the first person is insulin resistant and the second person is insulin sensitive. And again, the fat has a great deal to do with that. The good news is insulin resistance can be changed despite what the medical profession may tell you. Um, you know, they're like, look, you have diabetes, you'll have it for the rest of your life. We can manage it with medication. We can have you avoid carbohydrates. Um, the good news is uh, a lot of us understand that that can be completely reversed. And that is, of course, great. Now, here's something really important. Our body preferentially uses glucose over fat. I'm going to say that again. Our body preferentially uses glucose over fat. In the last webinar on intermittent fasting, we discussed where energy comes from during the phases leading up to water fasting. And we said in phase one, energy is coming from the last meal that you ate, not unique to fasting. That's just what we'd expect. In phase two, the energy comes from your body's glycogen reserves, your storage of carbohydrates, specifically your storage of glucose. And then in phase three, once all the glucose is gone, which takes one to two days, depending on if you're female or male or how much uh, you can store in your liver and, and how much uh, muscle mass you have on you. It takes about a day or two. And then at that point, your body has to burn fat for energy because that's its only choice. Now, here's something really sort of logical to think about. Once you get into phase two here, you've got, like we just said, a day or two worth of glycogen reserves, whereas you've got weeks or months worth of body fat, even if you're really lean. You have several weeks worth of energy in the form of body fat. So why is it then that your body will always go after your glycogen reserves first, even though there's only a little bit of energy there, and it will leave your body fat alone? Why does it do that? Because glucose is preferred over fat and your body that's why the body does what it does. It uses the glucose, and then it only when that's all gone does it start using fat for energy. So the body is very smart, and we think I think we need to recognize that. So another one of the negatives of a ketogenic diet is ketosis. In other words, when you uh, put the keto strips in your urine to see if there are the byproducts of fat metabolism, aka ketones there, um, those strips cannot distinguish whether you are burning body fat or whether you are burning dietary fat, okay? Ketones will show up either way. So for example, you could eat a thousand extra calories from fat per day. You could be in ketosis the whole time because you'd be burning dietary fat for energy, but you could still have a lot extra and be packing on body fat while always being in ketosis. So just seeing you're in ketosis on those strips does not tell you very much. It doesn't distinguish dietary fat from body fat. So you can get faked out very easily. Now, Let's take a look at a couple of things we're going to look at here, dietary fiber, as well as a lot of the beneficial nutrients found in whole natural plant foods. 
Dietary fiber is incredibly important stuff. It helps regulate blood sugar. It helps maintain healthy cholesterol levels. It helps maintain healthy hormone levels that can keep us at lower risk for promoting different types of cancers. Of course, it keeps everything moving through your intestines, and most of us would rather feel light and clear uh, than clogged up. And then when we get a little fancier and we start looking at the human microbiome, we know that many different types of fiber feed healthy probiotic bacteria, and your overall population of probiotic bacteria is collectively known as your microbiome. These bacteria produce short-chain fatty acids. Uh, they're really cool to study, in my nerdy opinion. They're acetate, propionate, and butyrate, uh, two, three, and four carbon length short-chain fatty acids. And we could spend a lot of time on these. In fact, Dr. Karen and I go through uh, a lot of the details in our curriculum. But just really briefly, we'll give you the bottom line of a few of the benefits. These short-chain fatty acids regulate blood sugar by different mechanisms than the fiber did directly in the food uh, when it was coming in initially. They help to regulate appetite and they help reduce inflammation throughout the body. And there's a whole host of other benefits. So the more fiber you eat, the more of these benefits you get because the fiber feeds the bacteria that produce the short-chain fatty acids that have a whole host of benefits in our body. So let's just review here that the majority of the calories are coming from fat and you need to be pretty limited in your carbohydrate intake. So what we're going to look at in the next few slides is we're going to sort of try to uh, give ketogenic diets uh, their best foot forward and we're going to take 50 grams worth of carbohydrates from some different foods and take a look at what we have. Okay, so here we've got romaine lettuce, cooked broccoli, cooked quinoa, cooked lentils, avocado, chia seeds, and flax seeds. And for each of these, uh, some of them were pretty close, others I got exact. Uh, we got about 50 grams worth of carbohydrates. So 50 grams worth of carbohydrates from romaine lettuce, that's about five heads of romaine, you get about 32 grams of fiber. So that would max out your carbohydrate allotment uh, for the day. If you did the same thing maxed out on broccoli, you'd have to eat about four medium heads. That'd be about 24 grams of fiber. If you maxed out on quinoa, you could get about uh, six and a half grams of fiber. If you maxed out on lentils, almost 15 grams of fiber. What if you did it on avocado? Well, you can eat a lot more calories worth of avocado um, for your 50 grams worth of carbohydrates because uh, avocados are high in fat and relatively low in carbohydrates. So you'd actually get about 39 grams of fiber per day that way. Uh, for chia seeds, you'd end up with 41 grams of fiber. And for flax seeds, if you max out your carbohydrate intake, you get 47 grams of fiber. Uh, so the RDA is about 38 grams of fiber, depending on your size and weight and calorie intake. And so um, you can get your fiber recommendation, which, by the way, isn't the best recommendation, but at least it's, it's getting uh, decent. You can do that with these higher fat foods, but vegetables are so critically important, you have to limit your vegetable intake and you don't end up with, uh, with that much fiber because you're, the majority of the calories in vegetables come from carbohydrates, so you've got to restrict even your vegetable intake. So let's take a look here at uh, a more common mix. I'm going to uh, get to our roughly 50 grams of carbohydrates with one head of lettuce, one head of cooked broccoli, one avocado, and five tablespoons of flax seeds. Okay, so we're maxed out at our 50 grams. That comes out to about 14 net carbohydrate grams if you want to take the total carbohydrates minus the fiber. And most people say you, know, you want to keep the net carbs below 20 or so 
grams per day to stay in ketosis. So we're, we're maybe not quite at the limit there, but we're, we're pushing the limit. And so I'm going to take these four foods and we're, we're maxed out on carbohydrates now. So what else do you eat? Because you're only at 621 calories. I mean, for a physically active male, that might only be a quarter of the calories uh, that you need per day. And even if you're trying to really maximize your weight loss at about 1,200 calories per day, that's only half the amount of calories that you need for the day. So where are the other 50 to 75% of the calories going to come from? Well, you can't eat fruit or vegetables or nuts or seeds or avocados or coconut um, or grains or beans, because all of those foods contain carbohydrates, you're maxed out now. Any more carbohydrates, you come out of ketosis, and that's not what you want on a ketogenic diet. So you've got the choice of animal products, although they can't be milk products because there's lactose in there, and that's a carbohydrate. So it's either animal products or oil right? That's the only other plant food that has no carbohydrates, no protein, no water, no fiber either. So what we're going to do here is I'm, I'm sticking with a, a vegan plan here. So we are going to get the rest of our calories, another 1200 calories from olive oil and from coconut oil. And um, we're going to still be at 36 grams of fiber because we really couldn't get any more. Because if we got more fiber, we would have exceeded our carbohydrate limit and potentially come out of ketosis. So let's um, let's just take a look here. We summarized 36 grams. Um, and by the way, 11% of the calories came from carbohydrates, 4% from protein, and about 85% from fat. So now what I'm going to do, instead of adding, we still have the lettuce, the broccoli, the avocado, and the flax seeds, same amounts as before. But instead of adding oil, I'm going to add six bananas and 10 peaches. And that's also going to get the rest of our calories, about 1,200 calories there. Uh, we were at 1826 before, we're at 1837, so almost identical. Now, notice here that we have 77 grams of fiber instead of 36. So we have more than doubled our fiber intake by including some, if you will, forbidden foods into the plan. Now, you're out of ketosis, but in my opinion, you're going to be a lot healthier. Six bananas, 10 peaches. That, that, that's a lot of volume of food. Um, and in my opinion, that would make you a lot more full than 10 tablespoons of oil. By the way, um, in addition to the Pritikin study that I mentioned earlier, uh, I wanted to say that we were recently speaking at the UK Fruit Festival, and we met a gentleman there with type 2 diabetes, and he actually was writing down, like he keeps track of this, he was writing down his blood sugar levels each day while at a fruit festival, eating large quantities of fruits and vegetables. And for a day or two, for the first day or two, his blood sugar went up a little bit, but each subsequent day that he was there, they were consistently coming down. So that fits with Pritikins. And that is common when people eat fruits and vegetables, their blood sugar level comes down. Common, I mean about 90% of the time. And if 10% of the time that doesn't work, then there's some other modifications that uh, we can utilize to get people where they need to be. So here, just a quick sample. We've got our ketogenic vegan sample diet with uh, the extra calories coming from oil versus our fruit and vegetable and healthy fat diet. And we can see that we have more than doubled the fiber we have uh, more than doubled the protein because oil has no protein. And we've got a lot more carbohydrates, but those are from healthy foods. And we've got our fat intake at about 24% of the calories, which is higher than some people recommend. But I still think within reason, if you base your diet on fresh fruits and vegetables. Just for fun here, I looked at our same foods and said if we got 100 calories worth of those foods, how much fiber uh, would we get? And we can see that the vegetables are the highest per calorie in fiber. And But again, you've got to limit those when you're on a ketogenic diet. So here we have a number of foods. 
And the ones in red here are the ones that have a significant percentage of their calories from carbohydrates that need to be limited um, in order to stay in ketosis. So ketogenic diets tend to be high in calorie density because there's a lot of fat in there and fat has more than twice as many calories compared to the same amount of carbohydrate or protein. So that makes the food uh, pretty dense. Um, they are oftentimes low in fiber, although I tried to put their best foot forward. They can maybe get moderate in fiber at the most and they're low to moderate in nutrient density. So, so that's not so great. Now, over the decades, high fat, low fiber diets have been linked to a variety of health problems. And not only is there a correlation, there are major causative relationships that have been uh, discovered there as well. So things like heart attacks, strokes, impotence, hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes, obesity, and several types of cancers are associated with higher fat, lower fiber diets. Now, in terms of cardiovascular disease, there are two doctors who have made it into the peer-reviewed literature who have shown that the process of arterial plaque buildup that limits blood flow to the heart as well as other parts of the body can actually be reversed. And both of these doctors accomplished this with a low-fat plant-based diet. Uh, they're Dr. Caldwell Esselstein and Dr. Dean Ornish. Now, in going to some lectures by Dr. Ornish several years ago, I remember him saying that he tried to make the diet a little more liberal for people and to, to get it higher in fat in some of his uh, preliminary studies before he published his lifestyle heart trial, and it didn't work. He had to get the fat low enough in order to get this process to occur. Uh, and same with Dr. Esselstein. He does that with fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and beans. People eat that, their arteries clear out. None of the patients were in ketosis because the majority of the calories came from carbohydrates, yet they showed this dramatic benefit. And weight loss was a natural benefit of the diet. So <clears throat> no calorie restrictions, no food amount restrictions, just follow these parameters, eat all you want, and people lost weight naturally, never having gone into ketosis. Now, sometimes you'll hear folks say, well, they went on a higher fat diet and their total cholesterol went up, but so did their HDL. And HDL is the good cholesterol. And if that goes up, you're at lower risk for heart disease. And yes, there's some truth to that, but it's also taken out of context so often. You've got to look at the total to HDL ratio, the HDL to LDL ratio, that your total cholesterol level still counts, your triglyceride level still counts, your inflammatory indicators count. Um, dietary cholesterol and dietary fiber are independent risk factors. Then you've got to consider that not all LDL is as bad as uh, it, it sounds. You've got to look at the particle sizes and counts. And so there's a lot to consider. And um, my point about this is sometimes you'll say, well, this, this, and this indicator look better while ignoring uh, twice as many indicators that don't look as good. But what's great about Dr. Ornish's research and Dr. Esselstein's research is they didn't just look at indicators. They looked at the disease process itself, how clogged the arteries were and how much blood flow was getting to the heart. And if somebody does a study with a ketogenic diet looking at angiograms and PET scans before and after, and they can show in a majority of patients eating a ketogenic diet, they can improve those parameters. I'm all for it. But until that time, don't just give me indicators and cook the books with statistics. Um, and I wouldn't hold your breath waiting for that to happen. So uh, just some, you know, solid real life evidence here. So going back to dietary fiber, it does all of these important things. And when you limit your intake of healthy carbohydrates, you limit your fiber intake and, and you don't get as much of the benefit as you could be getting on a higher fiber diet. 
phytonutrients. Boy, we could spend hours, and we do actually in our curriculum, looking at a variety of phytonutrients, things like chlorophyll and carotenoids and glucosinolates and isothiocyanates and anthocyanins and polyphenols like resveratrol and elagic acid and so many others. And these, uh, we could spend hours talking about all of their benefits. And many of the foods that contain high levels of these nutrients are also naturally high in healthy carbohydrates. So when you limit your intake of healthy carbohydrates, in addition to limiting your fiber intake, you limit your intake of a whole host of beneficial nutrients and, and you limit your health as a result. Couple other thoughts before we finish up. Many people involved in ketogenic diets are very big advocates of coffee. Okay. And in fact, I just uh, two days before filming this, I listened to a ketogenic summit and now I'm on, an, on a few different email lists. And he, this guy was promoting coffee saying, oh, the problem is the pesticides, but he's got this great organic coffee and there's all these benefits. And, and you see that commonly with people who advocate ketogenic diets. You don't see people advocating coffee uh, who eat fruits and vegetables, especially people who base their diet on raw fruits and vegetables. I mean, if anything, we hear over and over and over again consistently that when people go on a raw food diet based on fruits and vegetables, typically they have more energy than they know what to do with. They, they feel incredible and it's awesome. No one's thinking about coffee. So why are the people in ketogenic diets so into coffee? Because all that fat and, and the lack of fiber and the lack of healthy foods in there makes them feel bogged down. And then they're looking for stimulants to give them more energy. All right, what else? So the bottom line here to summarize, it is great to get those CRAP, refined sugars, out of our diet. But when you restrict healthy carbohydrates, you miss out on a lot of good things like phytonutrients and dietary fiber. And it's all based on some very questionable claims. Claims like all carbohydrates increase your blood sugar and body fat, which is not true. And the claim that ketosis means you are burning body fat exclusively, which is also not true. Once again, you can be in ketosis and you could gain piles of weight um, if you consume too many excess calories, which is easier to do with a high fat diet compared to a lower fat diet. Um, typically lower fat diets, you can eat maybe twice the volume of food for the same amount of calories compared to a higher fat diet. And that's a lot of fun. I mean, who, who would rather eat less as opposed to more? I'll vote for more. It's fun to eat lots of fruits and vegetables and you feel so good and you stay at a healthy weight and it's sustainable over the long term. So I will uh, end off on this slide here, touting fruits and vegetables, a slide I borrowed from our last webinar on intermittent fasting. And, and we see so many benefits to uh, fruits and vegetables. We don't want to limit our intake of those based on misinformation. In another few years, here's my prediction, ketogenic diets won't be trending as much as they are now. But no doubt, another form of a low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet will emerge. Uh, you know, there was Atkins and the Zone and Paleo, and now we've got keto, right? These things go through cycles. So uh, something else is going to come up based on not understanding the distinction between different types of foods that are high in carbohydrates, which are the healthy ones and which are the unhealthy ones, and not diving into the true causes of insulin resistance, if they even consider that. But throughout all of these trends, fruits and vegetables will still be super healthy foods and will form the foundation of a super healthy diet. So better yet, why not just transcend this trend and skip right to the healthiest diet possible that will help you achieve your goals more quickly and it will help you sustain them for a lifetime. We wish you all the very best in your endeavors. In today's webinar, we covered just a little tiny bit 
of the information that's available to those of you who would like to continue on your journey learning with us. Before we tell you more about how you can do that, we'd like you to consider the theme of our webinar series this year. We truly want all of you to be trend-proof, or at least very trend-resistant. Why? Because for those of us who are motivated and willing to make meaningful dietary and lifestyle changes, misinformation is probably the single largest hurdle to the process of achieving excellent health. No matter what you eat, there's someone out there to tell you why it's bad. We have the great fructose scare causing people to avoid really healthy foods like fresh fruit. We have people telling us we have to severely limit our fat intake to be healthy, and others telling us we have to eat mostly fat to be healthy. Uh, there's even people who warn us against eating vegetables. So look, folks, we are pro-fruit, pro-vegetable, and pro-fat, but all in healthy proportions within the context of an overall healthy diet and lifestyle, matched up with your individual tastes, desires, personal preferences, and individual biochemistry. Now, another trend I've seen over the last 8, 10, 12 years is that someone is actually really achieving excellent health and they're feeling great and enjoying things. But then somebody comes along with some misinformation and makes them question what they're doing and then this actually throws them off track because they're you know they just can't get past what uh, this other information is saying when you are really well educated you're so much less susceptible to this happening to you so for example what if somebody tells me i don't get enough protein well i'm not thrown off track because i know from experience i can build muscle pretty easily and I know the science behind the claims and, uh, and, and, and I'm covered. What if they tell me there's too much fructose in the fruit that I'm eating and I'm going to develop obesity, fatty liver disease, and diabetes? Well, I know my glucose A1C, insulin numbers, liver function tests, and my percentage body fat, and they're all really healthy. What if they tell me I need fish for DHA? Well, I know my DHA levels. I know the science behind it. I know that I'm not insulin resistant. I'm not suffering from depression or brain fog. You can't knock me off track because I'm too well educated. How about raw cruciferous vegetables and thyroid function? Over the last 32 years, I've consumed almost 10,000 heads of raw cauliflower and lots of kale and collards and, and some broccoli and cabbage here and there too. And I know my thyroid function's excellent. And so again, education has made me very much trend-proof and erroneous claim-proof. Um, now, on the other side of the spectrum, we have tell people telling us we should be fruitarians or we don't need to practice good dental hygiene because animals don't brush their teeth or there's no such thing as a B12 deficiency. Well, I'm educated enough to know those things aren't true either and they're important factors to pay attention to to achieve excellent health. And when you have that level of education that leads to that level of confidence, you can truly achieve a lifetime of supercharged health. Our curriculum, Mastering Raw Food Nutrition, is designed to do exactly that. It's a 12-month online and interactive program, and our next group program begins on August 28th of 2019. There's a time commitment of two to four hours per week. So if you can commit a few hours a week for a year, cover the tuition costs and make sure you follow through and pay attention and participate in the class, you can dramatically increase your chances for lifetime health and have a really fun time in the learning process as well. I'm first going to tell you a few of the topics that we cover in the course, and then we'll go into how it is actually delivered. So we cover a huge array of topics in our curriculum. Pretty much everything you ever wanted to know about plant-based and raw food nutrition or even nutrition in general. Based on our decades of personal research, course development, education, and clinical experience in this field. 
So we cover calorie density, blood sugar regulation, one of my favorite topics. Dr. Karen covers raw food sources of so many nutrients. And as you can see here, some examples, calcium, vitamin D, vitamin B12. Go into essential fats, one of my favorite topics. Acid alkaline balance, cleansing. Where do you get your protein? Human digestion, enzymes. Longevity and youth extension. We look at a bunch of uh, long-lived populations around the world. We look at a bunch of cellular uh, mechanisms of physiology to, to put two and two together and figure out all how it all works. We look at health statistics, the history of raw and living foods, different approaches to raw food nutrition, food combining, raw food weight loss connection that, that builds upon what we learned from calorie density, Classic studies in support of plant-based nutrition. We cover Pritikin, McDougall, Ornish, Esselstein, Barnard, um, so much. Uh, Dr. Campbell's work, you know, the classic data that's there. And, and we actually have about four hours worth of that. We go on then to look at why we think there are some additional advantages to more raw foods in your diet as long as you're there in the whole food plant-based realm. Um, so we cover various substances that form when we cook foods, depending on the food and the temperature and the cooking method and the time. And, you know, we go into all the details there. We talk about nutrients uh, and how heating changes nutrient levels. And yes, we cover beta carotene and lycopene very thoroughly. Uh, moving on, Dr. Karen takes advantage of her biology degree and looks at different plant families and different foods and how that affects nutrient levels. And you really start to put two and two together. Um, let's see, different points of view on candida. Dr. Karen looks at DHA in terms of xenoestrogens and phytoestrogens. And then that combines with my advanced fatty acid section, where we look at things like omega-3 conversion. And by the way, after six hours of going through all the fats, that's when the student I mentioned earlier in the webinar put two and two together and realized why someone who had left the movement didn't need to if they were educated in the, the material we talk about in this class, for example. Survey of superfoods. Dr. Karen goes through all the science and looks at marketing claims versus scientific reality and gives you a fair, accurate assessment so you know which one of those things might be helpful and which ones are just a, a bunch of hype. Um, she expands on nutrients, raw food exaggerations, history of human food choices, another Dr. Karen section. Did our brains get big because of meat and fat consumption? Was it from cooked carbohydrates, starches? Was it from fruit? She objectively looks at all of those competing theories and makes sense out of them in the context of what we should be eating in the 21st century here today. Animal products, menu planning, um, more wet, raw food weight loss, carbohydrates and expanded view. Dr. Karen goes through all of the different types of sweeteners out there. Now, we don't think you should be consuming many of those, but some people like to use some. It's good to know what you're dealing with. Research in support of raw food nutrition. That's a many hour section over a few weeks. Some people say there isn't science and research to support raw food nutrition. Absolutely not. They just don't know where to look. Nutrient analyses of, I mean, it's just, 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 it's so incredibly thorough. Um, then we start talking, we just build upon everything. An overview of energy. This is where Dr. Karen looks at questions like, does all fructose turn into fat in the liver? Does it all turn into body fat? We go through the metabolic pathways, but in an understandable way, and we make sense out of all this stuff. Advanced functions of dietary fiber leading into probiotics and prebiotics leading into the human microbiome. And even before that word was buzzing and trending, we laid the foundation to make all of this stuff make sense. Um, overcoming challenges and pitfalls in raw food nutrition. There are so many of them. And then near the end of the course, for those of you who are interested in going out and educating others, we have some built-in educator material. We actually give you some presentations. You can see it says your name here. You fill in your name, and then we show you how to modify and personalize 
your presentations. So you've got a structured, really excellent, solid presentation, but you personalize it so it doesn't seem canned. And then we handle how to handle audience members, credibility, topics, putting an event together, building an audience. We've got the basics of internet marketing there. So for those of you with a desire to go teach and coach others, this is incredibly valuable information. Most of our students, however, are not in that camp. They just want to learn this information for themselves and their friends and their family. And for those students, this section near the end brings all of this stuff together and integrates it so well. And when you get questions from your coworkers, your friends and family, you're able to handle those with confidence so you can take a leadership role instead of feeling like the weirdo. And so basically, by the time you finish this course, our students' level of understanding about a whole food plant-based diet with a foundation of raw fruits and vegetables is at a very, very, very high level, much higher than most of the people educating out there today. And there's so much they appreciate from the thorough and unbiased perspective that we share. Our bottom line position is that you all you have to do is tell the truth and the benefits of plant-based and raw food nutrition are naturally revealed. No outrageous claims, nothing crazy, just amazing health supporting results. Couple of quotes from our Mastering Raw Food Nutrition students last year class. So Diane says, Hello, Drs. Rick and Karen. I am so thankful to have been in your class. It has really been a guiding light through the maze of food information. Your scientific preciseness in evaluating what is hype from the real truth has been a real help. The detail and depth of the presentations are way beyond what I expected and are a real example of how to evaluate truth from error. Thank you for being so honest and teaching how to be critical thinkers, a skill for all of life's endeavors. Thank you all for your conscientious teaching. Now, Diane is somebody who had been on this path, has been on this path for longer than us. She's got a long history with this, but just like so many other people, all of this stuff coming at us today is causing confusion and eroding confidence, but we're so happy to hear from her that she is back to feeling really confident about what she's doing and has made some additional distinctions to bring her health up a few levels. A doctor from Indiana in our a couple of year ago class says, medical research has turned into this avalanche of new facts and theories. I think the course gave us ways to do our own research directly and start making more of our own decisions on what to believe. And I actually forgot to mention it, Previously, let's get back to this section. So Dr. Karen here has a section called Searching for Science-Based Health Information. This is where she turns her, her experience as starting as a, a research assistant and doing all the research that she's done over the years. She actually teaches you how to find credible scientific information out there and make sense out of it so you can continue the learning process long after this class is over. We are always so happy when other healthcare professionals join us for the class. We've had medical doctors, nurses, people with PhDs in physiology, chiropractic colleagues, naturopathic doctors, dietitians, uh, et cetera, join us. They always appreciate how accurate the science is but at the same time, let me make it very, very clear that our course is designed for people without a science background, so everything is easy to understand. So Denise from Ecuador said, when I decided to take this course, I already had a certification in plant-based nutrition and mindful eating. So certification, not a doctorate degree. I decided I needed to know more so I could understand my body and restore my health and also help others. This course was very useful, very easy to understand. Doctors Rick and Karen are great teachers. And she said, thank you. And Denise, you are more than welcome. It was literally our pleasure. Now, as far as the way the course itself is delivered, we have put a huge amount of effort into making very high quality videos 
somewhat comparable to what you're seeing here on this webinar where you have a PowerPoint presentation and either Dr. Karen or myself giving the presentation with our uh, high quality microphones here so it's easy to follow along with. We have about two hours per week of videos and over the course of the year, that's about a hundred hours worth of video content. You can watch those videos on your own schedule. So they're there the whole time and once we release each new set of weekly videos, they stay there for the entire course because things build upon the stuff before and we keep building and integrating and adding to the picture and seeing how it all fits together so you can always go back and review everything. Now each hour of that content, when we put this curriculum together, once we were already in 20 or so years to our paths and had earned doctorate degrees, had done lots of research, um, had had our own clinical experience, once we got to that point, every hour that you see in our course was about a full-time week worth of research, investigating, thinking about how to spell it out so it makes sense for everybody, making charts and graphs and putting the PowerPoints together so you don't have to spend thousands of hours and years and years worth of time trying to figure things out. It is all condensed down and it is an incredibly efficient use of your time because we know that people's lives are busy. Each video is typically broken down, or each two hours is usually broken down into videos of 20 to 30 minutes to make it easy to watch a segment at a time or just to, you know, keep going through all of them. We also provide for you some very comprehensive notebooks. There are four notebooks that we physically mail to you throughout the course of the year. That's about 900 pages worth of notes. And these notes are designed to complement the videos. So if you have your notebooks open while you're watching the videos, you don't have to try to write everything down as quickly as possible. Although if you do wanna write something else down, just hit pause, take a few notes, and continue on. But the majority of what we say on the videos and the majority of what you see in the presentations are actually in the notes for you. So that way you've got the notes there, you can watch the videos and really pay attention so the information sinks in, so you understand it, so you can use it. Everything is designed with our students in mind. And I'm gonna see if I can make myself bigger here. And I'm gonna take a look over here. And if you give me just a second, I'll, I'll show you um, a couple of samples of one of our notebooks. And so here we have Dr. Karen's section. Let's see if I can line that up with the camera on the connection with uh, vitamin B12 and folate. Uh, here we have a section on essential fats. We can see uh, near my thumb there the different types of fats and, and the different shapes that they are. Uh, let's see. We go into omega-3 and omega-6 food sources. Uh, we've got uh, inflammatory considerations. There's omega-3 conversion. Uh, the next section after that is pH balance. So um, here we have uh, some, of, some more from Dr. Karen. And basically everything's laid out in logical bullet points so you can see and follow along. It took an awful lot of effort for us to put this together, to think it through, to coordinate it with the videos. But once again, it's all designed to help you understand what you are seeing. And our students have told us over and over again how much they appreciate having those notebooks because once the course is over, they are lifetime reference material. And again, many of our students have told us they refer to them frequently when they wanna look things up again and figure things out and review. Another one of our students, Rhonda from South Carolina, tells us in today's world where most people have no true understanding of nutrition and how our bodies function, this should be a required course for all high school students. Uh, we think for everybody for that matter. With an obesity epidemic skyrocketing, studying what foods the body needs to stay healthy and thrive 
would change the direction of the next generation. And we could talk a lot about that. We are absolutely on the same page with Rhonda. And we love when our students start to really see that big vision and how much of a difference those of us who are properly educated can go out and share and how much of a difference that can make for people. So we talked about the videos that you watch on your own schedule. You've got the comprehensive notebooks that complement the videos to enhance the learning process. We also have conference calls. They're on Tuesdays. We have six to eight of those per month at two different times on Tuesdays to cover people from different parts of the world because we have students from all over the globe. And that is where you meet with us in small groups with your fellow students and ask questions about the course content and get feedback directly from us to help clarify, make sense out of things, and make sure you're understanding what you're seeing and, and for us to be there for you. We don't just plop a bunch of stuff down on you and say, okay, you're on your own. We're there for you every week, except the last Tuesday of the month, we take off. So even if you can't make a particular call, we've got it set up so you can type in questions in advance or even during the call. And on the calls, we go back and forth between live questions and written in questions. We answer those to the best of our ability, and then we record and save all of the calls so you can ask questions in advance and then even if you're not there on the call, go after and listen to the recording and you've got everything covered. It's not quite real time, but it's still direct interaction with us and our students really, really appreciate having that interaction on those conference calls. Kim from Decatur, Georgia, said, After being vegan for 18 years, I was very indecisive about mastering raw food nutrition, especially with the time and cost involved. I'm so glad that I decided to take the class and feel that the education I gained is well worth the time and money spent. I now have a great understanding of the importance of raw foods and which should be included daily, supplementation, medical test requirements, and foundational and research background. This class really cuts through all of the rhetoric, and that's so very true. She also said, I love the all-encompassing, non-judgmental, down-to-earth manner you both have. I felt very welcomed to participate in the calls, speaking of those calls. I immensely looked forward to the videos and calls each week. Thank you both for this education and experience. And Kim, you are more than welcome. So in addition to the videos, the notebooks, and the calls, we also have a Facebook group. And that's where students get to know each other a little bit, uh, general community support. And we found over the few years of teaching this course online now that the Facebook group really comes in handy at maybe half of our conference calls when we're answering questions. We will post some additional supporting information in the Facebook group. So it might be a link to an article about, uh, I don't know, heavy metals and sea vegetables or, or you know, something uh, relevant to the course discussion. Uh, it might be a journal article reference or something else that we use, uh, again, to support the question. So the Facebook group really comes in handy as well. You're not required to be in the Facebook group, though, if you don't want, because some people uh, have legitimate concerns about their privacy with all going on with Facebook today. But it, it's a private group. No one else is in there. Uh, it, it's pretty safe. We, we have yet to have any type of problem. So that explains the basic ways that the course is put together. Now, in terms of Dr. Karen and I, on the one hand, we expose you to many, many different topics and ideas. Uh, like you saw in those slides, you saw the thumbnails of, of some of our videos in the course. So the thing is, though, we are a married couple and we're both very enthused about what we're doing. So on the one hand, we're different people and you get a different perspective, but we're very well integrated. So all of that material integrates together in the curriculum. You see how it all 
fits together as a whole as we keep building and expanding and adding more things in. It's very, very cohesive. And, and that's just so, so important because one of our primary goals is to cut through the confusion so all of our students understand things. And yes, we're pretty nerdy, but again, that, that's to your advantage, though. Um, and at, at, to my knowledge, we're the only dual doctorate degree couple in the raw food community, or I think in the plant-based community. Now, if one's a doctor and the other makes recipes, we have no criticism with that. But it's really cool when Dr. Karen reads something or I read something and you know, we're trying to figure things out. We can talk to each other about it. And there's so much synergy in that because we're both understanding things at a very deep level. So you put all this together and it is a winning combination. Laura from Mexico said, this has been the best journey of knowledge in the path of a healthy life. Many of my doubts have been clarified with scientific support. In this world where so much false information is shared, it's imperative to have the truth. Mastering raw food nutrition is a great opportunity to learn and understand in the best way. She also said, I really love the way you've put together the course. Both have a clear speaking voice that helped me understand pretty well. Thank you. And Laura from Mexico, like many of our students, are from all over the world, and English is not their first language. So over and over, we've heard that people can understand us well, um, and that's when people are, you know, from, again, all over the world. And, um, and so that's really helpful. So if English is not your first language, you can probably still do well in the course. If you're following this webinar, you'll be able to follow the course and you can always hit pause and go back and catch up. And, um, and we're really happy to hear Laura's comments. Tim from Canada said, I had just recently become a raw vegan a short time before starting the course. For me, the course was a lifesaver. I am the only one I know who has taken such a dramatic dietary change and no one around me knew anything about it or could help me along the way. It was tough listening to friends and family asking so many questions and basically <laughs> saying I was crazy. The course was there to educate me and in time, Others began asking me questions about health, a fantastic course to help anyone who wants to improve their knowledge on how to be healthy. And, and we know that Tim's health improved dramatically based on what he learned in the course. And Tim's a great example of someone who he already has a full-time career and he wanted to learn about this information. But when people asked him about it, he had solid information to share with them. So over time, he didn't seem so crazy. Laurentiu from Romania said, This course gives systematic and structured information loaded with examples and studies that can help understand better the need to eat vegan and the benefits of a raw vegan lifestyle. And Carla from the UK said, I have learned so much from this course. Dr. Dina's break down the information without bias and give you pure scientific facts. I love what I have learned from this course, and I am so glad I chose this course over IIN. That's a whole other big discussion. There are other programs out there. Various ones have their advantages and disadvantages. So to summarize, our program covers two hours of professionally made videos per week. You have thoughtfully designed notebooks for each subject, four notebooks overall that we mail to you. Uh, near weekly conference calls, and a Facebook group for support. And it's all designed to help you understand this information so you can achieve a lifetime of supercharged health. Remember earlier when I showed you the photo of when I was overweight and having a bad allergy day? And based on the way I felt, I was motivated to make some changes? I made the decision to change my course and I am so happy that I did. Now it's time for you to make a decision. You're watching this webinar because you're interested in plant-based and raw food nutrition and in taking your knowledge to the next level so you can supercharge your health and maintain it for a lifetime. 
At this point, you've already got a really good idea if you want to continue your learning journey with us. Our next group program begins in late August, and once it fills, it won't be offered again until the summer of 2020 and likely at a higher price. You can watch the course videos on your own schedule and re-watch them as many times as you'd like. This gives plenty of time for the information to sink in. And then in addition to the comprehensive set of notes to help you follow along with the weekly videos and to be lifetime reference material, we also have the almost weekly question and answer sessions in real time in small groups directly with us. Or like I mentioned, you can type your questions in in advance and listen to the recordings afterwards, so close to real time. The Facebook group is also there to support the learning process. We love connecting with our students and we'll be there with you the whole way for all 12 months. You can access this course anywhere you have an internet connection, which is most places on the planet. We'll be sending you an email shortly where we'll invite you to sign up for a time to speak with us to answer any questions you may have about the curriculum and the structure of the class to help determine if it's a good fit for you. You can also click on the schedule link that's on your screen right now. We look forward to speaking with you about your health goals and how mastering raw food nutrition can help you achieve them. Now we're going to take a five-minute intermission, and after that, we'll be back to answer your questions. In the meantime, please feel free to sign up for a time to speak with us.